ஓம் சஹனாவது சஹனோ புனத்து சீரியங்கரவாவகை தேஜஸ்வினாவதீதவஸ்துமாவகை ஓம் ஷாந்தி ஓம் பூர்ணமத பூர்ணமிதம் பூர்ணாத் பூர்ணமுதச்சதே பூர்ணய பூர்ணமாதய பூர்ணமேவசிஷதே ஓஷாந்திஷாந்திஸ்மிருதிபுராணம் நமாவத்பாதம் ஷங்கரம் லோகசங்கரம் ஷங்கரம் ஷங்கராச்சாரியம் கேசவம் பாதராயணம் சூத்திரபாஷ்யவ் வந்தே ஈஸ்வரோரூராத்மே மூர்த்திவேதவிபாகினே வியோமவியாய தட்சிணாமூர்த்த நம சிவசமாரம்பாச்சியமியப்பந்த வந்தே குருபரம்பராஸ்தந்தோ வை ருக்காரஸ்தன்வர்த்தகிருத்தீயஸ்ட்வர்ஸ் ஜாகிரஸ்வப்னசுஷுப்திஷுஸ்ஃபுடதராஜிபீலிகாந்தனுஷோத்தாஜிணி ாலோஸ்துஷாமீஷா <laughs> said in the morning third line says saivaham sa eva aham sa she is i whether she sambit it is said the word sambit is in feminine gender sa mean that sambit this pronoun this sa is the nominative singular of the feminine word tat sahatavute sate tah etc so sa is the form of the pronoun tat tat means that in english also as well in sanskrit the pronoun tat is used for something that is well known sa samvid that samvid that which is well known the consciousness that is well known i don't know consciousness swami ji it is well known to whom it is well known to everyone because you don't have to make any effort to know that we must make an effort to know this part meaning that the part requires to be illumined by consciousness then alone the part can become the object of our knowledge how does the part get illumined by consciousness consciousness is a self first illumines the mind through then there is mind enlivened by consciousness then emerges through the eyes in this case the sense organ of perception 
Eh? Context is object or part. So that way consciousness eliminates the mind, mind eliminates the eyes, eyes eliminate the object such as part. So in that sense, it is consciousness that eliminates everything. Because eyes are not self people then eyes are not conscious entities. When mind also is not conscious entity as Vedanta teaches, mind also is matter, because mind also is a product of the five elements in their subtle state. Therefore, mind also is matter, meaning it is insentient. Of course, eyes are matter, they are the product of the element fire, so eyes also are insentient in the Vedantic term. Only thing that we call sentient is that which self shines, shines by itself. The only thing that shines without any assistance, without any aid on its own is I, I, I. I am, I am, I am. If you say in the morning, that is how we are always conscious of ourselves, I am. Then to that we may join other things like I am tall, I am short. And that is what uh, is called the costume, I am joining the costume along with the actors. I will, that's okay, but that I am is something always I am conscious of, known to me. There's only one thing that is that reveals itself, that is I am. Everything else is revealed in light of I am. I am is I consciousness. And that reveals itself and everything is revealed in light of consciousness. As you say, the first of mind is enlivened by consciousness. Eyes are enlivened by the mind and then these eyes illumine the objects such as a part. So, so, therefore, consciousness is something that is experienced by everybody's I am, I am, I am. We may not have made a note of that. And Vedanta wants us to make note of that. Understand that you cannot experience this tree or, you know, pot or table or chair or any object unless you first experience I am, I am, I am. That must be first experience. The deep sleep state, I do not experience I am. Therefore, I do not experience anything. Because that I am through the sense organs eliminate the sense objects. In deep sleep state, the I am is not known by me. Therefore, nothing is illumined in deep sleep state. I am unaware of everything in deep sleep state. Because I am not aware of I am in deep sleep state. This is just told to say how that I am, which is consciousness, is self-effulgent. And therefore, whether we want it or not, we always experience it. So, Sasambit, that Samvit, that consciousness that reveals itself as I am, I am, I am in the heart of all the living beings, Saiva, that alone I am. The consciousness alone I am, that alone, so alone means exclude something. That alone I am, that means that what is other than that I am not. When I say that alone I like, this particular flavor of ice cream is all that I like, then I don't like other things. I exclude everything else. Alone, eva, sa, eva, that excludes everything other than sa. That consciousness alone I am. Then what are you not? Nacha drushya vastu. I am not drushya. Drushya means that which is perceived or objectified. And Every interaction there is the subject called drashta, object called drushya, and the drashti or the experience. 
दृष्टा दृश्य दर्शन देन यू आर राइट नाउ फॉर एग्जाम्पल श्रोता श्रोतव्यम श्रवणम द हियर द हर्ड वर्ड एंड हियरिंग द स्पीकर द वर्ड इज स्पोकन स्पीकिंग so these three entities are involved in every experience <coughs> so that consciousness alone i am i am not anything other than consciousness so we'll come to that so first first two words is describe what is the nature of consciousness what is the nature of myself by the way consciousness means i so i am the subject matter of vedanta by the way vedanta only talks about i that's the reason why one of brahmacharis when we were studying in sandipani he had a sign in front of him swami ji is talking about me you know he would always remind himself <laughs> i do not think that when swami talks of brahman or something that's it some place else you think brahman means some place else it's not whatever word swami ji uses whether it is brahman it is self consciousness in sanskrit so many words are used samvit is one word bodah chit or chiti so many words are used to denote consciousness but that is i so Vedanta only basically talks about it may talk about many other things will come back to i because i is the most important entity in my life and that i is the cause of all my unhappiness which i the i that is wrongly perceived is the cause of all my unhappiness that very same i when rightly perceived becomes the cause of my happiness when i see myself as contrary to what i am being that whenever i see myself as a limited being which is quite contrary to my nature because the i am limitless by nature as these verses tell us whenever i see myself as a limited being i become unhappy i become and happy i have become dissatisfied with myself i don't like myself i do not like a limited self therefore whenever i find myself in my perception it may be wrong perception but in my perception if my conclusion is i am a limited being i become unhappy meaning that i do not require anything other than this conclusion that i am limited that's all i need to be unhappy so if you somehow make me feel and um, you know limited dependent helpless makes me unhappy when i see that i'm all right so whenever i'm all right in my perception i'm happy when i'm not all right in my perception i'm not happy simple as that thank you swami from now i say that i'm all right but you may say that but you must find it you know by saying that i'm all right i do not be called right by seeing that i'm all right i be called right first to say and then see so thus this i the samvit is sa that samvit which is most famous which is known to everybody as very self because it is self shining i have no option other than to experience some bit so next some bit is described in the first first line says jagra swapna susupte shus futatara ya samvid jrumbate again ya samvid that samvid that very famous samvid that famous consciousness even if we do not know people who know the scriptures they know very well so it is well known among them if it is not among us ujjumbhate 
Ujrumbade means what? That which suprakasate, which manifests. The samved or the consciousness that manifests. Where does it manifest? Jagrat Swapna Sushuptishu. Jagrat, waking, Swapna, dream, Sushupti, deep sleep. So Vedanta teaches that every day we go through these three states. They call it three states of consciousness, three states of mind, waking, dream and deep sleep. Right now most of us are in what state? Waking state. So waking is described. Because after the rest in the afternoon and a cup of coffee, Adityadi Anagrihitai Chakshuradi Indriyai Sabdadi Sthula Vishayana Upalabdi So what is waking? This is waking state. What is the character of the waking state? That I know the world of the objects through my organs of perception. Indriyai Arthopalabdi When we experience the objects through our sense organs. That's called waking state. That's how we always experience Swamiji. How can we experience color with our eyes and how can we experience sound without our ear? So we always require sense organs. But now we come to another state called dream state. Each one of us has experienced a dream state and sometimes the dream is so vivid that we do not even know that we are dreaming, we think that we are actually experiencing at that time. Atmavod says, Svakale Satyavad Bhati. When the dream is going on at that time, the dreamer thinks that what I am experiencing is real. So to the dreamer, the dream world is real. We say dream world is unreal, not from the standpoint of dreamer. The dream world is unreal from the standpoint of the waker. When you wake up then from the standpoint of our waking state, we say, oh, this is all Swamiji, it's all wrong, Mithya. I won a million dollar lottery, you know, in the dream, it's all gone. You don't have a penny with me. This I realize. In the dream, I thought I was a millionaire. When I wake up, that pen in my pocket. And thus, so we, when we wake up, we know that the dream is <coughs> Vedanta cause Mithya. So dream is a very beautiful example of what Mithya is. Mithya can be translated as unreal, appearance, projection. So, in the dream also, the experiences seem to be very similar to the experience in the waking state. Therefore, when we are dreaming, we do not even know that we are dreaming, we think that we are experiencing a real thing. But the whole dream world is projected by my mind. So, when I go to sleep, then my mind creates a whole dream world. Whatever I could not get in the waking state, that's what I create in the dream. And I said, you know, at this, on the dining table, the husband is sitting, the Swami is sitting, everybody is sitting. Then they gave, the, the hostess gave me the rasagulla. He said, skip this person, you know, her husband. So in all sympathy I said, please, serve him also. No, he doesn't get. This is a military rule, you know. <laughs> and nobody could say anything. So what can this poor fellow for 45 minutes that dinner is lasting, he watches everybody eating rasgulla. And he feels so 
excluded and you know so miserable. Therefore, in the dream state, now, these are the well, dream state. They tell us that the mind projects what are the strong impressions in the waking state. The so dream is a product of the experience of waking state. Meaning that theoretically we cannot experience in the dream what we are not experienced in the waking state. Generally. No Swamiji, last night our Swami used to give this example. Last night I saw a red dancing elephant. Red dancing elephant, yes. That is because he saw a woman in red sari. He saw a, you know, another person dancing and he saw an elephant. So therefore in a dream he combines all of them and sees a red dancing elephant. But what you see in the dream has to have its root in the waking. There is dancing in the waking, red in the waking, elephant in the waking. A dancing red elephant totally may not be in waking, but then because the mind projects based on what it is experienced. This is what they tell us. No, Swami, I many time I experienced a dream which I never experienced in the past. Then we may have to say that maybe you experienced it in your previous birth. This, this is an excellent, I mean, you know, we have an answer to this previous birth provides answer to many things, you know. And karma provides rest of the answers, you know. So what can you say? Because mind requires a basis for imagination. And that basis is experience in the waking state. So we say that the dream is a projection of the mind based on the impressions that it gathered in the waking state. <coughs> Call it impressions, samskaras, vasanas. And therefore, vasanamaya padarth akara paninamena. So those vasanas or samskaras, you see, whatever we experience right now, this is an experience that we are having. Every experience leaves this impression in our mind. Many impressions are so feeble that, you know, they just as though come and go away. But some impressions also can be deep. Depends upon what the experience is. All of a sudden I get, then that may leave a deep experience in me. I was scared or some, some kind of sound happened. So if there is an experience that is deeply engraved in my mind, it is likely that that may appear in the dream as an experience. In short, dream is the, the projection of the mind based on the impressions of the experiences that the mind gathered in the waking state. Although in the dream we do not even know that this is a dream, it looks so real. There also Swamiji, I was looking through eyes and hearing through my ears, but those eyes were different. And ears were different, those sense organs were also projected by the mind. These are not these eyes. Because that is called sleep when we withdraw our identification from this body. Vedanta teaches that our personality consists of three kinds of bodies. What you perceive through a sense organs is a gross body. Then there is what they call a subtle body, which is responsible for imparting the life to the gross body. This is otherwise a lifeless entity. The gross body by itself is a lifeless entity. There is a subtle body inside and that is what imparts the life to the gross body. Therefore, Vedanta explains or our scriptures explain what is called death. Death is the departure of the Subtle body from the gross body. When does it, how long does it remain? As long as my karma is there, so long subtle body remains here 
enlivening the gross body. That karma prarabdhar karma is over, then this subtle body departs to another destination. At that time, now there is nothing to impart sentience in his body, therefore the gross body becomes lifeless. That shows, in fact, there was something that was imparting life to it. Doctors don't accept this business. They don't accept subtle body. They don't accept atma, accept nothing. They accept only body. And they naturally say consciousness is a uh, prop, you know, attribute of body. As long as some combination is here in the heart or in the brain or some place, so long the consciousness is there. When that changes, then the consciousness is not created and the body dies. Which is quite alright. For the scientist, that is alright because scientists can only accept what can be demonstrated in a laboratory. They can't accept. For them, scripture is not a pramana. For them only, reasoning is pramana, yukti. So scientists are nayayikas. Nyayakas means those who accept nyaya or reasoning as the pramana. So scientists are people who derive all their conclusions from inference. You perceive something and infer something. So perception and inference are the basis of all the conclusions that the science derives, which is all right. And therefore they very strong is your subtle body. How much does you weigh? How do you prove subtle body? So then somebody experimented when subtle body departs. So they weighed this body, you know, when he's alive. And the person died. Then they said there was some ounce or difference of weight or something. I mean, that's ridiculous because subtle body cannot have weight. It's called subtle, which cannot be perceived by a sense organ. So it can't have form, it can't have shape, it can't have weight, it can't have these things. But poor fellow, poor Vedantins, you know, they feel apologetic before science. When scientists ask this question, you know, we feel that we should have to answer them. And therefore we should try to provide them the proof in their language, which we cannot. But anyway, so no scientist and no doctor is going to accept this explanation. But this is what Vedanta teaches us. What's the proof that there is subtle body? That this body is alive. But who says this body is alive because of something else? Body is alive by itself. Meaning that consciousness is a property of this body. So anyway, we will not get into that. All I am saying is that the sentiency that the body enjoys is an account of another so-called subtle body which is within this body. And when that body departs from here, then this body, gross body, becomes lifeless. This is what we call death. So gross body and subtle body. There is a third body called the causal body. Gross, subtle, causal. What is causal? Not casual, causal. Causal is a word derived from the word cause. So so called body that is the cause of the gross and subtle bodies. So why do we have this body? Vedanta asked this question, why do you have this body? Swamiji, I took birth to fulfill my agenda. We are born with an agenda to fulfill, that's why we acquired this body. So I performed the karma, this body result of that karma. Why did I perform karma? Because I desire. Usually an action is, perf- is a result of some desire within my mind. So action is the result of a desire. This body is the result of action. Action is the result of the desire. A desire is the result of what? Vedanta says desire is the result of ignorance. Who desires? I desire. Who is I? I who is limitless desires to become, and so that means I do not know that I am limitless. Right? I would never desire. If I knew who I am, if I knew that I was a billionaire, do you think I am going to go to somebody to see, you know, get some loan of a few hundred dollars now? 
I don't know. There is many, uh, you know, a lot of uh, wealth buried under the ground, I don't know, and therefore I think that I'm a poor person. So I think that I'm a small little thing, but in fact, my nature is limitlessness. So really desire doesn't make sense. The Atma, which is who is limitless, desiring doesn't make sense because only limited entity can desire to become free, free from limitation. All our desires are to become free from some limitation on the other. So in our, the self, limitless, desire has no place and still there are desires. Why? Because I do not know that I am limitless. Thus Vedanta explains that a desire arises from the ignorance of the true nature of myself. What's the true nature? Limitlessness. If I knew, would I desire anything? Nothing, because it, all that I have, whatever, all can be desired. Praptas se he attained what is already attained. I don't know. Therefore, the ignorance of the essential nature of myself creates in me a sense of limitedness. And I cannot accept the limitedness of myself, and therefore, I will become free from the sense of limitation. A desire is the result of my feeling a sense of limitedness. I think I am limited because I don't have enough money, I don't think I have, I'm limited because I don't have a house, limited because I don't have a vehicle, whatever be the reason for me to feel limited. But whenever I feel limited, there's a desire to become free from that sense of limitation. So desire is the result of limitedness of Atma. Now limitedness of Atma, how can it be? It is because of ignorance. When limitless is my nature, I look upon myself as a limited entity. And therefore, ultimately, ignorance is the cause of desire. So what is the cause of desire? Ignorance. What does desire do? Desire makes me perform actions. Who the actions do? Actions create this body and then the whole life. So this body and this life is a result of action, of prarabdha karma, which was a result of a desire, which is a result of ignorance. So what's the original cause? Ignorance. Uh, the Upanishad describes, when, when Upanishad describes the process of creation, it says, so karma yata, Ishvara desire. So before commencing the creation, Bhagavan desire. Bhagavan and desire, what is this? Ishvara desire. Can Ishvara, Ishvara is limitless. How can it desire? Limitless desires because the limitless does not know that it is limitless. So Kamayata, he, he had, you know, he sort of accepted for himself this kind of desire and then created the world. But therefore Vedanta teaches that the cause of everything is ignorance. Co immediate cause of anything is karma. Cause of karma is a desire and cause of desire is ignorance of the self. Therefore the original cause is self-ignorance. So that's called causal body. Self-ignorance is called cause. It's not a body, but they call it body, causal body. From that is created, no, because I, I, I feel that I'm limited, I must become free from limitation, that I can, that I can happen only when I, I fulfill my desire, that can happen only when I perform an action. To perform an action I require a body, for desiring I require a mind, therefore for I require body, cross body and mind, subtle body to desire, to perform action, to live life. So this is how the cross and subtle body are said to be the cause of desire which in turn is the cause of, the, of which ignorance is the cause. So therefore ignorance is the primary cause. It's called causal body, which create, which brings about desire, it brings about a need of subtle body, 
in gross body. So then it's called causal body because it's the cause of subtle and gross bodies. So we have three bodies. Gross body, within that is subtle body that enlivens the gross body, and that which is cause of both gross and subtle bodies is the ignorance which is called the causal body. Now the primary lessons of Tattva Bodha. So our personality is explained as consisting of three bodies, gross body, within which there is subtle body and causal body is not a body but it's ignorance. So pertaining to or corresponding each of these bodies there is a state. Waking, dream and deep sleep. So what's a waking state? This is a waking state. When I'm identified as gross body, right now I'm functioning through the body, which means through sense organs. So when I'm functioning through sense organs, that state of experience is called the waking. When you go to sleep, you know what we do? We give up identification with the body with sense organs and therefore when I am asleep I don't know where I am it's likely that I am sleeping here and I may dream about Rishikesh last night I had deep in Ganges how did that happen? this body was here but I thought that I was having a dip in the Ganges because that was the creation in the dream dream creation so, when we are identified with the gross body, that state of experience called the waking, to fall asleep, we must give up the identification of the body. Until then, we can't fall asleep. There is pain and stuff like that, then we cannot give up, then we cannot fall asleep. We should give up identity with the gross body. We, then, even mind identity also should be given up to fall asleep, to be deep sleep. Swami I could not sleep last night. Why? A lot of anxiety I was concerned. Next day I had to submit a report and on that report depending upon whether they would get a contract or not and then we had to go to our client and there's negotiations and all the tremendous stress and tension. If I, we don't get a contract then my job is in question. Etc. Etc. I'm imagining. So these fellows spend the whole night writing a report in his own mind, you know, because we cannot sleep when we cannot become free from the identification of the mind. Deep sleep happens when identification goes with body, sense organs, mind. Body and sense organs when they go away, dream state, mind is there, that also goes away, deep sleep state. So waking, my full personality is functioning. A dream, half personality is functioning, the mind is functioning. Deep sleep, no personality is functioning. Because why are we discussing? Well, that's what this verse says. So Vedanta teaches the essential nature of ourselves based on our day-to-day -day experiences. Vedanta does not uh, take resort to some exotic experiences to teach the nature of Atma. Vedanta only takes our simple day-to-day -day experiences like this one. And with reference to the experience teaches what our true nature is. Jagrat, Swapna, Sushuptishu, Svatatara, So one thing is that, that when I am dreaming, I am not awake. When I am dreaming, I am in a dream world at that time, I am not aware of the waking world. Is it not so? So waker goes to sleep, the dreamer awakes. Dreamer wakes up. When I fast asleep, dreamless sleep, that time the dream also is not there. Dreamer also is not there. Who is there? The deep sleeper is there. Waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. Too many lessons in one class. But anyway, 
cross body, subtle body, cosmology, waking, dream, deep sleep, waker, dreamer, sleeper. These are, all, these are simple things to I hope, you know, that these are what we are experiencing every day. Awake, dreaming, sleeping. The waker is no entry into dream and dreamer is no entry into deep sleep. Right now we are all experiencing the same objective world called Vyavaharika Satta, the objective world, meaning we see that tree or we see these ceilings and walls, all of us see them equally. In the dream when I am lecturing like this and seeing all the beautiful trees outside, it is my personal world. You don't have an entry into my dream world. And when I fall asleep, even that world also disappears. <coughs> In that, so the waker goes to sleep, then dreamer wakes up. The dreamer goes to sleep, then the sleeper wakes up. Then the sleeper goes away, the waker comes. So waker, dreamer, sleeper, waker, dreamer, sleeper. That's how the cycle is going on. Waker has no entry in the dream state, right? The dreamer has no entry in the deep sleep state. And deep sleeper has no entry in the waking state. Each one is confined to their own territory. They do not have entry into the other territory. Therefore, the dreamer doesn't know what the waker knows, sleeper doesn't know what the dreamer knows, etc. They are distinct from each other. This is so, dreamer excludes the waker, sleeper excludes the dreamer, and they, I mean each one excludes the other two. The waker excludes the dreamer and sleeper, the dreamer excludes the waker and dreamer, waker and sleeper, and the sleeper excludes the waker and dreamer. But there is something that is not excluded. Our important, important thing is, when each one excludes the other, there is something that is not excluded. To ex explain in a simple way, this is a chain, made of gold, you know. Imagine that is made of gold. I, do, I hope it is not made of gold. But then it will be risky to have it on my table. And this is a bangle also made of gold. Earring also made of gold. So what is earring is not this bangle. Earring excludes bangle. You follow? Earring is not bangles. Earring excludes bangle. Bangle excludes chain. Chain also excludes other two, each one excludes other two. What is it that they do not, they do not exclude? What is it that they do not exclude? Gold. Because they cannot survive without gold. Gold is essential nature. So also waker is excluded by dreamer and sleeper. Dreamer is excluded by the waker and sleeper. Sleeper is excluded by the waker and dreamer. But all these three do not exclude something of which they are made. There is one entity that is commonly there that passes through all the three states like the thread passing through these beads. This is waking bead, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. Where waker is, dreamer is not, dreamer is, sleeper is not, but in each, everywhere the, the thread is. So there is a thread that connects all the three states. That's the reason why when you wake up, uh, we remember, we say, how was the sleep Swamiji? That's a question that is you know, asked these days. How do you sleep? How? You sleep well, Swamiji? They are out of concern for the Swami, they ask. I slept well? Like a log? I did not know anything. I slept like a log. Did not know anything. But Swamiji, last night there was a lot of commotion. Do you know that a fire truck came? And then all kinds of, that happened in the Gurukulam, you know. Some fire was there in the house, so house outside. And so when Bhima said, I did not know anything. You know, she was not far away from there. And the fire truck came, all commotion was there. Did not know anything. That alone me, I was even farther than that. 
But so, all this commotion is going on, we don't know anything. I did not, what is the character of the deep sleep state? I slept well and I did not know anything. Sukhamaham asvapsam nakinchit avedisham. Vedantin say that when the person wakes up from sleep, he says, <coughs> he says, Sukham aham aswapsam, I slept well. The kinchit avedesham, I did not know anything. Therefore, in deep sleep, there are two experience, two things that are experienced. Sukham, in deep sleep, a person experiences happiness. And secondly, he experiences ignorance because he doesn't know anything. But Swamiji in deep sleep, there is no awareness. In waking there is awareness, therefore I am aware of these objects. In the dream there is awareness because I am aware of the dream object. In deep sleep there is no awareness. Had there been awareness in deep sleep, then would I not know that I am I'm fast asleep and I am enjoying the sleep? A dream is a, a sleep is a very desirable experience. There is one thing that we do not resist. The teenager will ask, Mom, just go to school, go to school, every day going to school. Beta, go to sleep. Every day do I have to sleep? He doesn't say that. <laughs> Nobody protests, you know. Oh, sleeping again today also, Mom. No, he doesn't even need to be told. Because sleep is a desirable experience. We look forward to sleep. So we prepare our bed and everything in such a manner that, so that preparation shows that we are looking forward to a pleasant experience, you know. And secondly, I hate to come out of that experience. I just slam the alarm clock because I don't want to come out of that experience. That shows that sleep must be a very pleasant experience because I look forward to sleep and I am hesitant to come out of that. <coughs> this is an important thing for Vedanta. Each state Vedanta, it teaches us something. So deep sleep teaches us something. What does it teach? That you are experiencing happiness there, freedom. In deep sleep, we are free. <coughs> no stress. No strain, is it not so? If Bhagavan did not give us deep sleep, in three days we'll all go crazy. But then all the problems are gone, all complexes are gone, all anxieties are gone. I'm free in deep sleep state. So deep sleep state also is an example of freedom, moksha. If you understand what moksha is, deep sleep is sort of an example, not moksha. It is not moksha, but then we can sort of get an idea of what moksha is by understanding what deep sleep is. Then in deep sleep, we experience freedom. In deep sleep, we experience happiness. Nobody will deny that. Why, you know? Why do we experience freedom? Because I don't have to carry that cross on my shoulder. Which one? This, this ego. The ego and the sense of identity, you know, sense of I, sense of individuality, there is no sense of individuality in deep sleep state. I forget myself. In waking I'm very aware of myself. In dream also I'm aware of that self. Deep sleep? No. But as Swami used to give, I must have told you this example. These three uh, persons, you know, three or four, these were riding in the train, an Indian train. And by chance, they got their seats close to, you know, one after the other together. So that one of them is a uh, Brahmin. <coughs> other one is a Muslim. Third is a Christian. Each one of them are very staunch, you know. 
and therefore they keep their separate identity. When they eat their food, they take out from their thing. And this Hindu will make sure that he doesn't touch that fellow, you know, otherwise he'll get polluted. So each one maintains identity in the waking state. Isn't it? Each one is stiff. Don't touch. Brahmana, Christian, Muslim. Then they had all evening dinner. Now the train is going on. The rhythm of the train is very, you know, slowly and slowly. Yeah, you feel slow, you know. You start dozing and slowly then fall asleep and then you are fast asleep. That time this fellow's, this fellow's hand goes there. This chap's leg, they become like spaghetti, you know. These three people who refused to touch each other when they were awake, in deep sleep, no boundaries remain because there is no self-awareness. There is no awareness of a sense of individual. I am so and so, that awareness is not, and that is freedom. So when we become free from sense of smallness, in deep sleep it happens by Ishvara's grace. And we have to awarefully do that. In the waking state we must awarefully sleep. Awarefully sleep means what? Sleep means that I am not aware of anything. But aware fully sleep means I'm aware of myself and nothing else. So therefore sleep is a good example of moksha because there we experience freedom. There we experience happiness. Unfortunately, we are not aware at that time, you know. Even deeply we were aware, oh I'm experiencing this, that's it, then you don't need Vedanta. Then all we need is just go to sleep and we are all mukta. Even though we are free, we don't know, unfortunately, therefore it doesn't help us. But that is the Sushupti, deep sleep state. Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti. Waking, dream, deep sleep. Waker, dreamer, sleeper. Waker doesn't have entry into dream and deep sleep. Dreamer doesn't have an entry into waking and sleep. Sleeper doesn't have entry into Waking and dream. Even then, when I wake up in the morning, what do I feel? Pragaswapsamiti pravodasamaya yaf pratyavigna. When I wake up in the morning, how is my experience? Oh, a new person has woken up. When I wake up in the morning, is it a new Swami that has woken up? Or the same Swami? who went to sleep, is the one who is woken up. When you wake up, what's our, what is our uh, awareness? I who went to sleep is I who is woken up. Is it not so? Sometimes we wish that some different fellow wakes up. <laughs> some people hope, you know, that all my anxiety, everything should go away, but it all comes back, it all follows me. But when I wake up in the morning, I know that I am the same entity who went to sleep is the one who has woken up. That shows there is a continuity. Is it not so? So Vedantins cite this experience of, this is called Pratyavya. Recollect, I recollect that I who went to sleep is I who has woken up. Not that every morning a new I wakes up. Same fellow wakes up. Never, they can wake, what I who was awake yesterday, I who was talking this morning is I who is talking in the evening and tomorrow I'll say I who was talking last night is the one I'm talking today. Same I continues. When everything else changes, one thing does not change. So waking goes away, dream comes, dream goes away, sleep comes, sleep goes away, waking comes, waker goes away, dreamer comes, dreamer goes away, sleeper comes, sleeper goes away, waker comes. They all exclude each other like the ornaments, but they do not exclude the gold. And similarly also, 
the dreamer, the sleeper, nobody excludes the one that is their core identity. And who is that? That that says Samvit. Jagat Swapna Sushupteshu Sputatara Yasamvidu Jrumbhate. Yasamvid, that consciousness, Ujrumbhate Prakashate, which shines. And waking, it clearly shines in waking, dream and deep sleep state. Which is free from the limitation of waking, dream and deep sleep. That Samvit I am. Saivaham. That Samvit. That consciousness, I am. Not this, I'm not confident of waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. I'm the one that is the most common denominator of the waking, dream and deep sleep. <coughs> so this is how uh, one part of the verse is explained. Who am I? I'm the one that is the witness of the three states, waking, dream and deep sleep. Who well, illumines the three states, that consciousness illumines the Waking, dream, deep sleep, that I am. Okay, then who you know, what you are not, that also will be told, we will continue. Om Purnamadaf Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachare Purnasya Purnamada Yapurnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Badarayanam Sutra Bhashya Krutau Vande Bhagavanta Punaf Punaha Ishvaro Guru Ratmevi Murti Veda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshinamutaye Namaha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om